All right, so in 2 Kings chapter 3, let's jump right in here. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. So if you remember that Ahab was king, you know, he, he lived and he died, extremely wicked king. He was married to Jezebel, and um, it was prophesied against him that his posterity would be cut off. And, um, you know, all the, the house of Ahab basically was going to be killed. So we haven't gotten to the completion of that prophecy yet because he had uh, Ahaziah, his son, took over in Ahab's stead and ruled for a short time. But then um, he, he was killed. Now we have Jehoram because Ahaziah didn't have any children. Jehoram, his brother, another son of Ahab, is ruling in uh, Ahab's stead. So... This is going on during the reign of Jehoshaphat. Of course, Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And Jehoshaphat is a righteous king. He's a godly king. He's doing basically the right things. We see him, he's made a couple mistakes, but he's, he's overall known as a, as a king that did right in the eyes of the Lord and is doing a, a good thing. And we see here that now Jehoram is reigning. Verse number two says, And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother, for he put away the image of Baal that his father has made. So he's still a wicked king. He still does evil, but he's not quite as bad as Ahab and Jezebel because it says that he didn't worship Baal. Now, but then it says, nevertheless, verse three, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. If you remember, you know, Jeroboam was the, I mean, that was kind of the turning point for Israel. They could have been doing well, especially when, when the house of David screwed up, when Solomon screwed up and ruined things for, for the kingdom of it, the whole kingdom of Israel before it got split up. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had a really good opportunity to kind of take the torch and start doing right for God and be the righteous nation. And he just blew it. He made the, the images, the golden calves, and he set one in Dan and one in Bethel and just said, hey, you know, worship, here is the Lord. He didn't, he didn't make up a new God. He just created these idols, which then just led the people away. And he, he instituted different things. He was saying, you know, these be thy gods. So it's not, I mean, it wasn't the Lord, clearly. I mean, he did, you know, create a false God, but he was still like saying that this is the same God. He, he, you know, he wasn't completely departing from what they supposedly had known to be God as the Lord, but he was changing everything and obviously just, just committing abominations. I mean, it was just horrible to build these, uh, these idols and, and set them up. So we have Jehoram now, Ahab's son. He's not quite as wicked as Ahab. Now, Ahab was real, real wicked. And we see the progression. Jeroboam is always looked at as like, man, he's a real evil king. But then you start getting to the point where we're at now, and it's like these kings are just getting progressively worse and worse and worse. It's like they had done worse than all the kings before them. They had done worse than all the kings. You know, and Ahab was one, the last one, where he's just done worse than like all the kings that were before him. Extremely wicked kings. And um, Jehoram, Jehoram is still an evil king. He's just not quite as bad as Ahab, his father. But he's still into this idol, idolatry, this idol worship. Because even though he's not worshiping Baal, that specific false god, it says that he, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. So he's still cleaving to that idolatry. He's cleaving to these false gods. Clearly, he's not uh, interested in the Lord. We see that in the story later when, when, you know, Elisha, when they're looking for a prophet and Jehoram just seems to have all the answers anyways and doesn't care. Jehoshaphat's the only one interested in seeing what God has to think about any of this stuff. But um, anyways, let's keep reading here. Verse number four. So he's a wicked king. Verse number four. And Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and a hundred thousand rams with the wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. If you remember last week, too, we saw another king, and I don't remember which one it was. They were, they were rebelling. You know, we start to get more rebellion now that Ahab's dead. Ahab seemed to have a pretty uh, solid reign when it comes to his enemies and, and kind of having people subdued. Now you've got more and more trouble for Israel. There's more instability in the throne because you already have 
you know, Ahab died and his son died and now you've got Jehoram reigning and they're, they're facing all this stuff. They're facing now more rebellion. Basically what Moab was doing is they were just paying tribute to him by way of all of this sheep and goats and wool and, you know, they're sending him all of that stuff to satisfy them. It's like their taxes, basically. They're saying, okay, we're, we're subduing you and you owe us this and, and everything will be fine. They, said, they finally said, you know what? Not going to pay it. And really, what is it? Extortion. I mean, that's, that's all it is. When, you know, when these, these nations are kind of just controlling them, it's like, well, you pay us or else we'll invade you and, you know, and, and, and have war and, and cause you all kinds of problems and kill a bunch of people. Or you pay me. It's just extortion is all it is. But, um, but, I mean, that's the way of the world. Thankfully, we're not of the world, but that's, that's the way of the world and that's the way things go. And now they have trouble because Misha, king of Moab, is rebelling against them. So, Verse number five, it says, but it came to pass when Ahab was dead, uh, we read that, verse number six, and King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. So Jehoram's not going to take it. He's saying, oh, okay, you're not going to pay us? Well, now, and that's the whole reason. He goes and numbers, when it says he numbered Israel, what he's, worried, what he's concerned about, he's saying, how much of an army can I raise? How many people can I raise to go and fight this battle? That was the purpose of their census. You go number Israel. Okay, how many people? It's usually the males from 20 years old and upward because that's who they would use to fight in their battles. So he needs to say, okay, well, I got an idea of what the forces of Moab are. I need to count my forces and see if we're going to go in and win this battle. Now, what we see here, the, the way that Jehoram acts this is the way of the world. This is someone who does not believe in the Lord. This is not the way that a believer should be acting. Someone who, who, who believes in God when faced with a problem or faced with a challenge. I mean, especially in this situation, there's no, you know, this is ridiculous. They're not, they're, they didn't even have like, you know, Moab was a whole nother nation. I mean, it's not like, uh, it's not like the people that, um, the, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, you know, all, the, all the nations that were in the land of Canaan, that were in the promised land that God gave to them. I mean, this is a whole other nation of, of Moab that, you know, yeah, they may have wars with each other, but they had no reason to, to just continually be oppressing Moab. But um, regardless of the reason, and this is being an act of aggression now against him just because he's not being paid, which again is, a, is another thing that's wrong with what uh, Jehoram's doing here. But he numbers Israel and then he goes and looks to recruit even more help. So he looks to the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, to try to bolster and get more troops to go fight with him, to fight his battles with him. And this is the mindset of the world. This is the way that you would think if you don't have God as your defender, if you don't have God to look to to fight your battles for you. You notice he has nothing to do with God at all. He's just saying, well, I'm just going to count my troops. I'm going to go get some help and we're going to fight this battle. And that's what happens. And look at verse number seven. He says, and he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art. My people is thy people and my horses is thy horses. Keep your finger here. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 19. I've already pointed this out in 1 Kings. But it's worth pointing out again because you would think that Jehoshaphat would have learned his lesson. I've already mentioned Jehoshaphat it goes down in history as being a righteous king. But this he had a real strong problem with and it was getting involved in fights he shouldn't have been getting involved in and helping out the ungodly. He was already rebuked because Ahab came to him with a similar problem. Ahab, when, when during Ahab's reign, he came to Jehoshaphat and saying, hey, are you going to help me out in this fight? I got to go to battle. Can you, you know, can you join forces with me? What do you say, buddy? What do you say, son-in-law? You going to come with me and fight with me? And he gave him the same answer. Yep, you know what? My people are thy people. My horses is thy horses. And now you have this other situation with Moab. And it's like, why are you going, first of all, why are you going to help Israel? Why are you going to help wicked Jehoram? Okay, yeah, he wasn't quite as bad as Ahab, but he's still following the son of, you know, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And he's still going to, to extort from Moab, which 
Okay, so they're rebelling against him. So what? What does that have to do with you, Judah, king of Judah? You got no business with them. But no, he goes off. And in 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2, this is where he's rebuked. It says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him. This is after the battle where Ahab was killed, where Ahab recruited Jehoshaphat. And he's met. On, once he gets back, he's safe at home, Jehoshaphat. Jehu, the son of Anani the seer. So a prophet comes to rebuke Jehoshaphat and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. This guy prophesied wrath from God for going and helping the ungodly. Now, I don't know how many times Jehoshaphat probably heard that in his life. Especially because he was doing so much good for the Lord. You know, he was getting rid of the Sodomites out of the land. He was fighting the Lord's battle. He was, he was worshiping God and seeking out prophets of the Lord. And here he gets a rebuke however many years earlier. And then it's like, you're going to go out and repeat the same exact thing and do the same mistake? What is wrong with you, Jehoshaphat? We need to be sensitive to God's word in the point where if you get a stern rebuke, and if you find that you hear something in your life, thus saith the Lord, you know, don't do this. This is, this, is, this is bad. This is a sin. You're going to be under wrath of God. Don't turn back to that stuff again. I mean, you hear that, you, you know, be able to receive it. Because I don't know, how, I don't, honestly, we don't know how this played out in Jehoshaphat's life exactly. I do know it wasn't good for his son. And I'm, I'm actually not sure if, if uh, 2 Kings goes into... Jehoshaphat's line that much because we're going more through Israel than Judah, but um, I think it might. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not too positive about that. There's in, in Chronicles, we sh for sure, though, we see that. And he pays a, a dear price in his future generations, in his posterity, for making these mistakes. And we could see how strong of an influence that it's made that he made affinity with the house of Ahab when he married into Ahab's family. I think that is the reason he just could not break that bond and say no to that household, that wicked household, that wicked family, and just say no, either for his wife's sake or whatever he thinks is honorable. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. And we need to be able to make the stand where we're standing with God over family. Now, look, I am a big proponent of standing with your family. I think it's important to have a strong family and, and to be there for your family and to honor your mother and father and to, and to support one another and do what you can to really help out your family. But when it comes down to an issue where you're going to be wrong with God by standing with your family, you need to stay right with God above all. Jehoshaphat chose his family over saying, no, I'm not going to help you because you're ungodly and wicked. Now, don't be confused. You know, people get in family arguments and fights over a lot of things, big and small, right? We don't want to blow up into, you know, make a, a, a mountain out of a molehill with our family and, just, oh, well, I'm not standing with you. And, you know, and like, there's a difference between a wicked person and having disagreements or fights or whatever with your family members. So, we, we don't need to just constantly be pushing away our family necessarily. But at the same time, when you, know, when you know someone's wicked, you don't need to be going and helping in their battles that they're trying to fight. You know, whatever that may mean individually, like in, in, in various situations. And I'm talking about, because Ahab was a wicked person. Extremely wicked. Jehoram was a wicked person. I mean, you see at the end of the chapter how wicked Jehoram is. He sacrificed his own son as a burnt sacrifice unto a false god. That is wicked as hell. Anybody who's going to do that stuff, yeah, you shouldn't have anything to do with them. I don't care if they're family or not. You avoid them, put them away, and have nothing to do with them. Because that is wickedness. You don't go and say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer up the lives of the young men in my nation to go help support your wicked cause. And that's what our nation's doing. Our wicked politicians, our wicked men in charge that are ruling, 
and saying, oh, yeah, we'll send all these families' sons and daughters off to go fight and get killed in some war to make some money, to profit, to go extort some nations for their, their natural resources or whatever. Go over to Moab and, and oh, you're not going to pay us? We're going to send in troops. And when it boils down to it, a lot of these skirmishes and battles and wars and fights and stuff that are going on in the Middle East and elsewhere, that's what it boils down to. Yeah. They're going to lie to you and say, oh, no, we're trying to liberate these people as they go in and kick down their doors and, and smash them in the face with our freedom and hold their curfews and hold them under gunpoint. Yeah, it looks, looks real free to me. And you wonder why there's so many people becoming terrorists and anti-American and be like, oh, they must just hate us for our freedom. They don't hate us for our freedom. You, they hate us for the freedom that you're bringing to them under the, the muzzle of a gun and terrorizing their families. They say, if that's freedom, we, we hate that. We have nothing to do with that. It's wicked as hell. But we see Jehoshaphat just, he's, he's too yoked up. He's too tied in with that family to be able to say no. And, you know, we all need to learn how to say no sometimes. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. Have conviction. Stand on God's word. Have some integrity and say, you know what? I'm going to refuse to do that. It may make people mad. It may make people uncomfortable. But I'm going to stand up and say, you know what? God's more important to me than what you think about me. And if you have any respect for me, you'll respect my decision. But if not, then whatever. Because I care about how God thinks about me more than what any other man thinks about me. And it's not easy to make that stand. It's not. To be honest with you. You know, some people can make that stand and make it look easy, but it's not easy. Just be prepared for it, though. You have to determine in your heart and in your mind what is important to you. Who do you care about more? You decide that priority. God demands the, the, the priority be him. It's up to you to make that decision. Joshua did many good things, but he was still falling into the wrath of God because of his decisions to disobey and to not stand with the Lord and to help out the wicked. Let's keep reading here in uh, 2 Kings chapter 3, verse number 8. So now he's, uh, he's agreed. He's agreed to go to the battle. So Jehoram's asking him, well, which way shall we go up? How are we going to do this? How, how do you think we should invade Moab? Uh, verse number eight, he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. So he said, oh, we're going to go through Edom and we'll attack them that way. We'll come in through the wilderness and kind of surprise them that way. So they got Edom involved now. It says, so the king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days journey. So they're going through the wilderness now, the wilderness, especially in that area, doesn't necessarily mean, like, like, when I think of wilderness, it depends on where you grew up from. Wilderness is out in the wild. But for many people, and myself included, when I, when I hear the word wilderness, I'm thinking, like, forests and, what you know, just, like, this different type of terrain. But literally, where this is in the Middle East, it's probably desert. I mean, that's what the wilderness is. It's more like, you know, you go down in Arizona, Central Arizona, Southern Arizona, and wil the wilderness is all desert. And usually, almost anywhere you go, wilderness is not necessarily hospitable. And it's definitely not when you read wilderness in the Bible. It's not a hospitable place. It's not easy to go through. So they chose a way that maybe strategically would be uh, a, good, a good route to go. But what happens is, is that they go by the way of the wilderness and there's no water for them. There's no supplies. And these are things you got to think about when you got these three armies, right, joined together to go fight in a battle and it's taking you seven days to journey and they don't have a supply line and there's no resources in the land. So now it's like, huh, we're going to invade and we're just going to die here in the wilderness before we even make it to the fight because we've got nothing to drink and our, our resources are spent. You know, the animals aren't going to be able to make it. We're not going to be able to make it. This is the predicament they find themselves in already. Poor planning. And then, uh, so that's where they decide to go. Verse number nine says, so the king of Israel went, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetch a compass of seven days journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. Verse 10, and the king of Israel said, alas, 
that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. What a arrogant, pompous man. Anyways, look at, look at how now he makes reference to the Lord. He doesn't follow the Lord. He doesn't believe in the Lord. But when things are going bad, he's like, oh, look, the Lord has brought us all together just to destroy us, just to deliver us into Moab. This is why the Lord brought us here. And first of all, I would think that why are you even arrogant to think that God is bringing you three kings together anyways, as if you're doing the right thing? The Lord's called us three kings together. The Lord didn't say anything about it. You didn't go ask him about it. That's for sure. And that's another problem with Jehoshaphat. He didn't go and get, seek counsel of the Lord before making his pact with them and, and going out and deciding to go to battle. See, that was what King David had done. When King David was decided to get in a battle, he would go and ask God first. Hey, God, should I fight these people? Are you going to deliver them into my hand or should I forbear? Should I go somewhere else? Should I run away? Should I do, you know, what should I do, God? And God would tell him, right. yep, go fight them. I'll deliver them in your hand. Nope, go this way. Nope, hey, you go over here and this is what I want you to do. And, and whatever he did, David would listen to him. Jehoshaphat's doing that, but only to a point. He only, he only does it like when he gets into trouble. We need to be seeking God's counsel before we get into trouble. We need to be seeking his advice from the beginning because that would save Jehoshaphat a lot of heartache right. and a lot of headache by going to God first and saying, God, okay, what are you going to do? But you know what? I think he probably already knew God was going to say don't go because he already heard it before. Don't go help the ungodly. But he was stiff-necked. He just wanted to do it anyways because of his, I assume, because of his affinity with the house of Ahab. I've seen no other reason for him do, to do that, especially with the way that his actions were in the rest of his life. It seems to be the only re logical reason that he would even do anything. So the king of Israel, Jehoram, is just like, oh man, what are we going to do? The Lord's going to deliver us in the hand of, a of Moab. Verse 11, but Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? He's like, isn't there a prophet here that we can at least ask God? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. So he's saying, well, well, we got Elisha here. And if you know who Elijah was, Elisha is the guy that was his minister. He was his servant. He's pouring hands on, the, on his. So um, Jehoshaphat, see, one thing that's good about Joshua, he's able to recognize a prophet. He knows when, you know, the same thing with Ahab when they had all these prophets of the Lord that were telling them how great he was. Oh, yeah, go up. God's going to deliver him in your hand. You got, you know, Jehoshaphat's like, is there a prophet of the Lord besides these guys? You know, besides these clowns? Can we get like a real man of God here? And he did. And that's when he saw Elijah. And that's when Elijah prophesied. But now we have Elisha. And um, it says in verse 12, and Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, what have I to do with thee? I love Elisha's response here and the way he just basically tells off Jehoram and the boldness that Elisha has to do so. He says, what have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moses. See again, He's telling the prophet of the Lord what God's doing. This is what the Lord's doing. No, no, you don't understand. The Lord brought us here to deliver us into Moab. It's like, why did you even, why did you even go to the prophet? The reason is because Joram didn't even want to go to the prophet. He's going because Jehoshaphat wanted to go. He agreed to go, but he's already got it made up in his mind. He doesn't want to go and listen. Verse 14, Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. He's saying, the only reason that you are even hearing my voice right now is because I have respect unto Jehoshaphat because he actually is a, a righteous guy. He actually serves the Lord. If it weren't for him... I wouldn't even be looking at you, let alone talking to you. 
And notice that Elisha was not honored to be in the presence of the king of Israel, going, oh, it's so nice to finally meet you. I knew your dad. I knew Ahab, huh? Yeah, I remember talking to him. No, he didn't do that. That wasn't the attitude he had. It's like, you know, th throwing up some phony front because he's in the presence of the king of Israel. Look, I don't care who you ever meet someday. Don't throw away your integrity and be fake and phony and pretend to like somebody because they're famous, because they're popular. You meet some rock star that's wicked as hell and, and turning all kinds of people to, to sin and iniquity and doing the work of Satan and be like, oh, you're so great. I love your music. Don't have respect to persons like that, especially for the wicked people. Have a backbone, have a spine and say, you know what? I don't even want to look at you. You think you're so big and powerful and whatever. I don't give two, I don't give a rip about you. It doesn't matter. I don't care who you are. Because I know that you're wicked and I don't have anything to do with it. I don't even want to look at you. Get away from me. Stupid, wicked people. You ought to be able to tell that to their face. You know, there's, it's one thing to have manners. But it's another thing when you have a known wicked person, especially, you know, like, like Obama or something. You know, imagine like Obama coming to town. I'm not going to be honored and say, oh, thank you. Receive some award or whatever. You're like, not that, that, like that would ever happen anyways. I don't have to worry about that. But <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you're in a chant situation. You're at a restaurant somewhere. And it's like, I'm not going to go get his autograph. I don't want to look at him. It makes me sick. And that's, that's the, that was the godly attitude Elisha had. So I'm not going to be honored by you. I'm not going to respect the person of the wicked just because you have a, you have a position of power. And, and don't be afraid to just call them out to their face. That, you know, anything that you, should, you could say about somebody, you, know, you ought to be able to say it to their face anyways. So if you're calling somebody, you're, you know, this person's really wicked, this president, this governor, or whatever, this, this rock star, if you're, able, if you're gonna stand there and say, man, I can't believe how wicked they are, you better not be two-faced and turn around and just start talking all pleasant and nice to them when you see them. Say it to their face. People need to hear that stuff. People need to finally hear, wow, I'm glad somebody's saying it. I'm glad someone's standing up to the wickedness. Verse number 15. So Elisha is going to prophesy, but it's not because of Jehoram. It's because of Elisha. Or it's because, excuse me, it's because of Jehoshaphat, king of, of Judah. Verse 15, now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Now, a minstrel is someone he called for that's going to play some music. And this is really interesting. It's only one verse, but you know, nothing in the Bible is there by coincidence or accident or just like, you know, there's no information given that's just unnecessary. It's all necessary. And, and what I find interesting here is that he calls for some music and it says, and it came to pass when the minstrel played. So once the music is being played, the hand of the Lord comes upon him. That's when the hand of God comes upon him. And one of the things that I see here. And, and I find this throughout the Bible, and I'm going to park it on this issue for just a little, a little bit, is there's a power to music that we need to be aware of. Music is extremely powerful, and it, it's not even, it, it, it's, it's, sometimes it can be hard to articulate how powerful it truly can be. But we can see a few instances like this in the Bible. And, and music can be used for great things. I think it's used in a very great way here that the, that the hand of the Lord comes upon Elisha when the minstrel plays the music. We use music to praise God, to glorify His name, to sing psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs of praising the Lord. 
And that's a great thing. And music is used throughout the Bible in many great ways. You know, Moses delivered a song unto the children of Israel in order for them to still be able to remember the word of the Lord, even when they turn and forsake God, they still have this song that's kind of embedded in their minds and carried with them and, and can stay with them from generation to generation to generation because they have this music, they have this song that they've learned and that they've memorized. It's, it, it's, it could be very powerful in a good way. And we're admonished in the New Testament in Colossians 3.16 to, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It is, it, it is a phenomenal thing. It's a glorious thing. Praise God for music. I love music. I love that we're adding more music to our service here. It really adds a lot to, to the praises and the glory that we're giving God. It really does. And it's more, it, it's, it, it adds, um, again, like I said, it's hard to articulate. It, there's, there's a feeling, there's a spirit added through the playing of the music. And that is a good thing, but we have to recognize this underlying power to music. Turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to see another instance where music is being used to affect somebody. And that, that person is, is Saul, King Saul, is using music as an instrument, as a tool, to affect the, the evil spirit that is, that is plaguing him from the Lord and to make that evil spirit go away. I believe this is good, godly music that Saul is using, just like Elisha is using with the minstrel. You know, this isn't the world's music. He's, he's playing something that is, that is pleasing to God, that is glorifying to God when the hand of the Lord comes upon him as a result of this music. 1 Samuel 16, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubled thee. They recognized the problem with Saul. They said, Look, you're being plagued by this evil spirit from God. And what Saul does, instead of getting right with God, as would be the solution, because look, when you're being plagued and troubled by God, there's a good reason for that. He wants you to correct a problem, not bury your head in the sand and try to find some other way so you just don't feel the problem anymore. Like when you sin, you ought to be convicted of that sin. The, what you don't want to do is just try to push that feeling away of guilt and remorse and just be like, no, I just want to keep on doing what I'm doing and just pretend like everything's great. So I'm going to take this pill, this drug, listen to this music, whatever, to make me feel better so I don't feel so bad because I'm in sin. That is the worst thing that you can do. But that's what Saul did here. So he says, look, you're being plagued by an evil spirit of God. So he says in uh, verse 16, let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. Jump down to verse number 23. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed, and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. The music had the power for that evil spirit that was plaguing Saul to depart, to leave. Now, I'm not saying what he did was right, but the, the purpose of me even showing you this is to demonstrate the power that is, in, that is involved with music. There is a, 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 like an unseen power that definitely has an impact on people and on things around us and spiritually especially. There's an evil spirit from the Lord plaguing Saul and that spirit departed when that music was played. 
And this is what's so dangerous about this is that listening to music when you're not right with God is, is, could be disastrous. Saul should have been vexed in his soul because he was in rebellion to the Lord. Instead, he wants to be able to continue doing what he's doing and not admit to being wrong and to feel good about himself. But even that only works for so long. Look at chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18, verse number 10. The Bible says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So there came to a point where he just, like, even the music wasn't enough because he's being plagued so much. And then basically the same thing happens in chapter 19. We need to be aware. Turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 28. We need to be aware of this power of the power that is in music inherently. Because there, if, especially when, you, when there's a good reason for you to not feel right with God, don't mask it and not fix the problem by listening to whatever makes you feel good. There is, I, was, I was having a conversation with somebody uh, quite a while ago about the issue of music. When I, fir when I first started hearing preaching, good preaching, right preaching on, on music and, and what we should be and shouldn't be listening to or singing or whatever, and I heard preaching against the, the Christian contemporary music and how it's just modeled after the world, where it's really you're just taking the rock and roll, all the styles, all the genres that the world's putting out there today and just slapping Jesus in it, and, but it's the same exact music. You're just, th you know, just using spiritual language and calling that godly music. Now, everybody's a little bit different. My wife is, is completely different than I am, especially when it comes to this matter. My wife couldn't care less about music in general. She doesn't notice when it's on. Like, I notice it everywhere. We go, you can't go anywhere without music being played. So, I mean, you go to restaurants, you go to gas stations, you, you know, it's like there's just music, music, music. Go to, you go to the grocery store, you go to Walmart, you go, it doesn't matter where you go. It's like there's just music playing everywhere. She doesn't notice it, doesn't bother her, doesn't affect her the way that affects me. I was trying to explain this to her just this week. I was saying, you know what, honey? Music is like a drug. It really is like a drug. And if you understand it that way, you can understand some of the power involved in music. Music can, I mean, for me, music gives me a feeling deep inside. Like a drug can give you a feeling. If you start getting high on alcohol or on drugs, you start to get tingly. You can have these different feelings, and that's what's attractive to it, right? That's what the attraction is of that sin of getting involved and in smoking dope or, or getting drunk or whatever because you get these feelings and they feel good. Well, just because something feels good in your body doesn't make it right. Actually, a lot of things that are really wicked to do will make you feel good. And music can do the same thing, which is what makes it even more difficult. See, when it comes to drugs and alcohol, it inherently has bad side effects. And it's not that hard to see the, the, the downside of getting drunk, right? Because you get drunk and then and you feel these great feelings or whatever, but you do all these stupid things and you act really wickedly. And then the next morning, though, you have a hangover, right? So it's like, oh, yeah, well, here's the, the flip side to that. Or you do drugs, same thing. I mean, you, 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 have, you have some... Um, some type of balancing out of like, yeah, this really isn't good. And then people getting involved in the fights and the arguments and everything else that goes along with getting involved with those things. Music is more subtle. Now, it gives you that feeling that, that, that you know, for most people, I know for me especially, very, very strong. I love music. I still, I love music. I have, I've had to change the music that I listen to and love to be the right music, godly music, because I listen to all kinds of music. I listen to country, I listen to rap, I listen to metal, I listen to rock, I listen to, you know, I mean, you name it. I listen to all kinds of different music. And, and I loved it. And I would listen to music 
from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep practically. I would have the headphones in everywhere I went. I mean, I remember even on, in high school on the sports teams, I brought my boom box on the bus and we just, you know, I was that guy, the guy playing the music all the time. I loved it. And man, it's, it, whatever it is that does you, it's, it's literally like a drug. But it impacts you. It impacts the way that you think. And just because you get a feeling from it does not make it okay or good. You have to get that through your head. Music has power. One of the things that I noticed when I started getting right with God and going to church, you know, I, I could realize, and I, I've heard sermons completely dedicated against worldly music and, and getting that garbage out of your head and, and out of your life. And, and you know, I would... Um, I destroyed my whole music collection. But there were times when I'd start to backslide and just like, you know, because you hear it all over the place. And it's so readily available on the internet and on the radio and wherever you are. It's like it's so easy to just listen to some music. Listen to the rock and roll. Listen to whatever. And I noticed this personally in my life. When I gave in to my flesh to just Oh man, I like I like this song and just and just feel this music. I would always get into some other sins in my life that, that I had no desire at all to want to get into. And it's this attitude of allowing yourself this this appetite to the flesh and the and the power of the music, I believe, giving you a bad spirit and 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 leading you to do other things. Because that's what the music is, you know, the worldly music of today. And just the worldly music in general, I mean, it, 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 the message that's bringing forth is not a good one. It's not a godly one. By any means, it, it's, it's antichrist, if anything. It promotes fornication, adultery, drugs, alcohol. It, it promotes all the worst things, everything that's against God. You look at, the, at, at what is actually being transmitted through the, through the words and the lyrics of the music. They're trying to get into your head. And the music itself has power. The music has its own spirit. And this is true. The music that is, that is like the rock and roll style, that if you, even if you eliminated the lyrics, that is going to give you a spirit of rebellion because that's what rock and roll is. That's why all the, 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 the metal bands and the rock bands, all the men have long hair. Why? Because they're rebelling against the head. Jesus Christ, like 1 Corinthians 11 says, they're dishonoring their head. And just the music alone makes you want to, you know, you're driving your car, you want, it makes you want to drive fast and do, you know, and just, just break every rule and do everything rebellious that you can. I mean, people get you into the drugs. Oh, you know, it's the revolution. You know, That's why it's called revolution, like the 60s and the 70s. It's a rock and roll revolution because they're revolting against what's decent and moral and upright. And it was done through the power of music and drugs and other things. And, you know, but, it's, but, but music was a, a driving force into that revolution. You think about other genres, in, do other things to your spirit, to your soul. The, the, the rap and the hip hop makes you want to grind and move your body in a certain way and a dancing, you know, like an improper dancing with, with other people, whatever. Like, they, 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 it's this force, this power that's behind this music. And we need to recognize this. And you need to recognize that it's not just all harmless, that there's actually something evil behind it, the world's music. I believe this firmly. Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to see here some attributes of Satan. Verse number 13, Ezekiel 28. The Bible says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. Satan was created as an angel. Satan was created as a beautiful angel, an angel of light. And it, you know, I mean, all these precious stones is how God created the devil. Because he wasn't evil from the beginning. Sin was found in him. He became evil. But when God created him, he was beautiful. He was magnificent. He was a glorious angel. Look at the next, the next part here, that, the same verse. The workmanship of thy tabrets 
and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. His tabrets and his pipes is referring to, you know, the way that he speaks is referring to his vocal cords, referring to them in the way that, that you know, musically tabrets and pipes. He says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Satan was, was created a beautiful creature, and I believe was created to, to, to have very musical ability, you know, very great musical abilities and talents. And they were designed to worship the Lord and sing beautiful songs unto God. But we see in the way that he was created, he was given this gift. He was given this ability through his tabrets and his pipes. Satan knows people. Satan knows the desire of sin. Satan, I mean, there is not a right way within him. I believe that Satan is behind the world's music and, and knows its impact on us as people and is trying to pervert the godly music, the way that God intended music to be played to steer us away from God and to drive us down that wrong path. Music can affect people like a drug and it can be just as addictive and powerful and it can also ruin lives if you're getting involved in the wrong music. I know this, for, I am very passionate about this subject because of how much I know, I mean, we should be able to take everything for face value from the Bible, but I know from personal experience on this subject how powerful music can be and how much it can lead you down the wrong path and you start backsliding and you start listening to the world's garbage, junk music, it is going to impact you in more ways than one. You may not even be able to realize it. You might not be able to draw the connections together, but look, I've done it in my life. I know that it's a fact. You might think you could just, oh, this is, this is fine. This is not that bad. And this is the problem with the, you know, the Christian contemporary. And, that's, and this is where I led into everything with was the conversation I was having with a close, a close relative of mine that said, no, I love this music. You know, it makes me feel so close to God when I listen to this music. And that was his argument. I, like, I don't see how this can be bad or wrong because I feel so close to God. I guarantee you, but he was listening to this stuff where it's just like rock and roll, just Christianized, right? It's more than just the lyrics. I, get, I could practically guarantee you without, no, I, mean, I mean, as much as I can know, the feelings that he was feeling, I felt through just the world's rock and roll music. This uplifting feeling oh man this is so great oh i feel so good oh what a great day this is, you know these feelings that you get it doesn't make you close to god necessarily i mean the mormons rely on a feeling that they have when they're trying to seek out the truth be aware that many things that are sinful provide a feeling that can be perceived as a good feeling I was into drinking and drugs. You know what? It felt good. I'm not going to lie to you when I was under the influence of those things. That, that was the whole point of doing it because it felt good. Gives you a funny feeling. But they're wicked as hell and they're going to destroy your life. Right. And they're sin and you shouldn't get involved with it at all. I was so curious about the feeling, but why? Because I was so focused on me and, and oh, I'm just going to do what feels good. That's not a right way to live. I know that the music can make you feel good. If you want to grow spiritually, you need to get it out of your life. You need to, un you need to recognize the power of music, what it's capable of doing. And I think we have a great example here, multiple examples in the Bible. Just to, just to lay the foundation, you know what? Music has power to it whether it be the right music or the wrong music. If you love music, I'm with you. I love music too. Get the right music in your heart. Because that stuff says, you know, I, it's a shame. It really is. I, 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 it, it's a plague more than a shame. It, it, it plagues my mind regularly. I have albums, 
upon albums, upon, you know, or CDs, right? Or, or not even MP3s, I don't, whatever, whatever technology, right? I'm talking about albums. Right? <laughs> From, you know, it's going back. But uh, regardless, you know what I'm talking about. I probably have hu hundreds, hundreds of complete songs memorized where I know every single word to every single song for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of songs. Because it's powerful, because it sticks in your head. I wish I didn't have that in my head. I wish I could go out somewhere and just be like, wow, like it doesn't even mean anything because I never even heard it before because I never really got into it. But it's not the case. All the more reason to be more on guard and to not let it creep in because as soon as you start allowing that, especially when you know it's wrong and you start allowing that, you're gonna, I mean, you open up the door, you open up the door that the devil will crack, he's going to kick it wide open. Let him that thingeth he stand and take heed lest he fall. Watch out for that power in the music. It will ruin and destroy your life. I mean, literally, I'm not even exaggerating here. I'm not just trying to, to, to scare you into not doing something like that. Like it's, it, it, the, the power is there. And, and it, the, the, the worst part is how subtle it is and, and how damaging it can be without you necessarily being able to, to make the connection. Let's keep reading. Let's, go on, let's continue in the chapter here. First, uh, 2 Kings 3. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse number 16. So Elisha now, he had the minstrel play. The hand of the Lord came upon him. It was a good music, godly music, and it, and, it, and, it, and it helped his spirit, and now he's receiving a word from the Lord. You know, when I listen to the good music too, it does help my spirit. When my spirit's in, in a bad spirit or if I'm, you know, like things are going wrong or bad or just frustrated or angry, sometimes I could just listen to, to the right hymn or sing the right hymn to God. And just like that, it changed. I mean, that's, that is part of just another illustration of just the power of music. And a lot of people, I see a lot of people nodding their heads, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. So the same way that good music does that, bad music does that too. I mean, the bad music is pumping something into your head that, that you don't want there. Verse number 16, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. So this is a miracle. I should say, and you know what? You need water? God's going to provide you water. And you know what? There's not going to be wind. There's not going to be rain. Because they're thinking, well, what's God going to do? Is he going to send rain? Nope. Oh, is going to be wind? Nope. Just dig ditches in, in this valley right here. Dig ditches here. Because God's going to provide you some water. And I like the next verse. He says, um, verse 18, And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. So he just, he just gets on telling me, I mean, it's going to miraculously just give him some water. And then he's saying, oh yeah, and this, this is nothing. You know, the Moabites being delivered in your hand, that's nothing. That's a light thing. I mean, what God's doing with this water is a greater thing than just being able to deliver the Moabites in your hand, is what he's saying. He's saying, see this with the water and in providing the life for you is way greater than God taking care of your enemies. Seek God for your life. Because that's what he's providing with them, with the water. Verse 19, And ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And, you know, I don't know exactly why God decided to do this. I mean, God has his great plan on, on these different things. Because it wasn't right for Josh to go and help him. We know that. And... I don't even necessarily think, you know, th this wasn't a righteous battle either for Israel. But, of course, God uses people and uses nations, uses wicked nations to judge other wicked nations and all, and, you know, and all this other stuff. But what I think is, is still cool about this is that he's just completely made uh, Jehoram look dumb anyways because Jehoram the one that kept saying, oh, the Lord brought us here to deliver us to the Moabites. Oh, the Lord's going to deliver us to the Moabites. And God just comes through and just, and just saves them miraculously. 
So Jehoram looks pretty dumb. Look at verse number 20. And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered that behold, there came water by the way of Edom and the country was filled with water. I mean, it's amazing. It doesn't even say exactly how it came. It just, this water came in. I assume it just kind of rushed in from who knows what, a dam broke, something, you know, some coincidence, right? That other people would chalk it up as something else. Water comes flushing in, so it fills up their ditches with water, so they have uh, water to, to drink and to survive by. Look at verse 21, it says, And when all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. So they got wind of this, that they were going to come and invade through the wilderness. So they, they get their troops ready. They're standing there, good to go. Verse 22, And they rose up early in the morning, and the sun shone upon the water, and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood. So this valley that they're in, it's not like there wasn't normally water there. They dug the ditches, one, so that they could drink, but then two, now they're looking at this water in the morning. And who knows if the sun was still like real red, shining on it, whatever the optical illusion was, whatever they were seeing when they looked out there, or it was still just part of the miracle of God, whatever. They're looking out there, and instead of just seeing water, they say, wow, this must be their blood. Like, their blood is just, just flowing through this valley. They must have turned on each other because they knew that, you know, Edom was yoking up with Israel and Judah, and that they must have just fought amongst themselves. And they just had this great battle. And was, that's why there's all this blood in this field. So um, it says in verse 23, And they said, This is blood. The kings are surely slain, and they have smitten one another. Now therefore, Moab, to the spoil. So they're saying, Cool, they all kill each other. We're just going to go in and get all their stuff now. We're going to spoil you know, everything, grab all their, their resources. And, uh, and uh, that was pretty easy. Verse 24, And when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites so that they fled before them, but they went forward, smiting the Moab Moabites even in their country. So they show up. They're just thinking, like, they're not ready to battle at all. I mean, they just went in there thinking, like, cool, we're just going to find whatever uh, uh, stuff we can spoil, all the, the, the things they left behind from the battle, just assuming they're all dead. And they just show up in the camp of Israel, and just, Israel's just, like, starts killing them. Just uh, picking them off. And... Um, then they, and then not only did they fight them there because then Moab retreats, it says in verse 25, and they beat down the cities and on every good uh, piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it and they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees. Only in Kir left they the stones thereof, howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. So, I mean, they're going through and they're just destroying Moab. Not only are they destroying them literally like in battle, but then they're stopping up their wells. They're ruining their land. They're cutting down the good trees. They're, I mean, they are just decimating Moab. And that's what God told them to do, by the way. That was, that was part of it. Verse 26, And when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even under the king of Edom, but they could not. So his last ditch effort is saying, you know what, we're not going to win this battle, but at least I'm going to go and just try to kill the king of Edom. If I can't do anything else, I'm just going to try to kill him. Couldn't do it. Even with 700 men with a, with a pointed attack, wasn't able to do it. Lost that. Verse 27 says, Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So Moab was, was destroyed here so much to the point where, I mean, we see this, uh, this wicked king of Moab and excuse, you know what? I just realized, I think I misspoke in the beginning of the sermon about Jehoram. Jehoram didn't offer up his son on the wall. If I, if I said that or implied that, I, am, I, I totally misspoke by that. Jehoram is a wicked king. He didn't do this. And, and I knew that. I, I, I completely misspoke, so I'm going to correct that right now. Um, I believe I said that now. I'm just like, wait a minute. That, Moab was the one that took his eldest son and um, it was that king of Moab that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And that is extremely wicked, obviously, offering up and, uh, and a burnt offering. Your own son, can you imagine doing that? Now, it was, you know, what's interesting is that people who want to attack the Bible will call that 
perverted or, or disgusting about God offering up Jesus Christ. Because they'll look at that and they'll say, well, how barbaric, how, you know, how can you look at this guy and say that's wicked when the Lord did that with Jesus Christ? But they're completely different. And you say, oh, how can they be completely different? Jesus Christ came and, and served a sentence and paid a punishment. One, Jesus did it willingly. Right. Also, I highly doubt that this guy's son was, was offering himself up willingly. But regardless, Jesus did it willingly. He, he knew what needed to be done. He offered up himself. He was without sin. And he was offering up himself as a sacrifice to pay the sins of the world. See, there is a, there's a punishment that needed to be paid for our sins. It needs to be paid. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And, um, you know, this guy wasn't, wasn't paying any punishment for sins. He couldn't do it. He has his own sins. Jesus offered up himself, and, and God allowed it to happen, to, uh, to pay for the sins of the whole world because he loves us so that the sin can be satisfied and that the whole world can receive eternal salvation. There is no benefit or result out of this sacrifice at all. It's completely vain and useless. And um, God is not looking for us to make this human sacrifice to please him. God sacrificed for us to be saved. We are not the ones that are supposed to be making the sacrifice in order to, to re receive salvation from God. And, um, I mean, there's, there's, on so many levels, it's just, uh, it's just completely wicked. It's nothing like what Jesus did for us. It really isn't. Jesus offered himself voluntarily to pay for the sins of the whole world. But, um, anyhow, let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that we can receive from your word. God, I pray that you would please just um, speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to retain the, the truths uh, after tonight. When we leave today, help us to make the proper applications in our life, dear Lord, that we can um, continue to serve you and, and to um, just be better followers, better disciples of yours, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to have a backbone and a spine like Elisha had and not, not to, to back down to anyone or, or to change our behavior just because we're in the presence of a king or of some honored person in this world, dear Lord. If they're wicked, God, help us to, to have the, the courage and the right spirit to just stand on your word. Help us not to um, treat even family members above how we should be standing and walking uh, with you, that, that we wouldn't choose to sin against you and to help the ungodly, um, that we wouldn't choose them over, over you and our integrity to serve you, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.